Good afternoon. I'm Laura Bloomberg, Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and I warmly welcome you to our 2021 commencement ceremonies. We all wish that we could be together in person to commemorate this really important day. And yet there are some unique advantages to delivering a virtual uh, commencement ceremony today. For one thing, we have graduates whose family members and friends and colleagues are all over the world. And indeed, some of our own graduates are all over the world today. So while it is noon or shortly after noon here in Minneapolis, it may be morning, noon, or nighttime where you are. Regardless of the time zone, we've glad you, we're glad you've zoomed in to join us. As you will hear many times from our speakers today, and it sort of goes without saying, this year's graduating class has navigated their education in incredibly unprecedented times, very unconventional experience they have had. And graduates, you've done it with a tremendous amount of determination. You've navigated the upheaval, the unrest, and most certainly the unfinished public policy business of this school, this community, and the nation with a remarkable sense of determination. You have persevered, and that says a lot about just what you are capable of achieving. You all, from this day forward, will continue to live your lives moving forward, and yet we all understand our lives by looking back and reflecting. When you look back at your time at the Humphrey School, I imagine you will reflect on the community that you have built with your colleagues, your classmates, and your peers as a community steeped in a fierce sense of social justice. It is a community that has grit and determination and compassion and courage. You are resolute in pursuit of your goals. You are impressive indeed. You may not be physically walking across the stage today and your professors and mentors may not be physically shaking your hands, but make no mistake, you have done the work. And we at the Humphrey School are incredibly proud of you. And I hope you are incredibly proud of yourselves today. You should be. Let me just share with all of our um, viewing audience a few housekeeping notes before I introduce our commencement keynote speaker to you. And I'm so excited for you to hear from her. First, today's ceremony is being live captioned for accessibility purposes. And for those of you familiar with Zoom, you know this, but some of you won't be familiar with Zoom. Um, so please know that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a, a tool panel and you will see a CC at the bottom. If you click on that, it will open the live captioning for you. Throughout the ceremony today, I also encourage you to share words of support and messages of celebration with the graduates. And you can do that in the chat feature that you can also open on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And it should pop up then on the right side of your screen. We also have a digital program available for you today. And you can find that to download in the chat function when you open it. And this year, just so you're aware, we're celebrating our students by elevating more of their voices. Typically in our commencement ceremonies, the students, the graduating students select one commencement speaker. And instead this year, we have invited a speaker from each of our degree programs to speak today. And I'm, I'm excited for you to hear from them. Uh, and now it is my honor to introduce our commencement keynote speaker to you, Ms. Keisha Gaskins Nathan. Keisha is the director of the United States Democratic Practice Program at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, where she is dedicated to advancing measures that improve democratic systems and build democratic culture in the United States. Prior to joining the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Keisha was senior counsel with the Brennan Center for Justice. She has served as executive director of the League of Women, Women Voters of Minnesota, League of Women Voters of Minnesota, there, that's it and the executive director of the Minnesota Women's Political Con Con Caucus. My goodness. Keisha would tell you that she was born in Boston, raised in Minnesota, and is now living her life in New York City. Ms. Gaskin Nathan serves at, served as a judicial clerk for the Honorable Alan Page and the Honorable Joan Erickson, both in the Minnesota Supreme Court. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice and Political Science from St. Cloud State University, my alma mater as well and she received her JD from Northeastern University School of Law. Keisha was a 2008 Feminist Leadership Fellow with the Humphrey School of Public Affairs Center on Women, Gender, and Public Policy. On a personal note, 
Uh, this year, I serve as the president of the National Association of Schools of Public Affairs and Public Policy. And part of uh, the responsibilities of the president is to identify the keynote speaker for a national conference. And it was my honor last fall to invite uh, Keisha Gaskins Nathan to deliver the keynote. And I was so grateful she said yes. And as I was listening to her speak last October, I knew for sure that she was who I wanted to deliver the commencement address for all of you this spring, because what she has to say is so timely and so consequential. Um, I hope you will settle in and listen to what she has to share with you now. I give you Ms. Keisha Gaskins Nathan. Good afternoon, and thank you to Dean Bloomberg, Humphreys faculty, staff, and students. Thank you to Kim Powell and all the university regents. I am humbled and honored to participate in this important ceremony. Congratulations to all the graduates, academic and leadership award recipients. It is my deepest hope that you are able to celebrate this important accomplishment with the joy and reverence you deserve. The digitation of this rite of passage changes the format, but not the substance or meaning of your accomplishments. The online nature of this ceremony will certainly change the pomp and circumstance, but should not detract from the recognition of years of hard work and dedication that this moment reflects in your lives. Congratulations to you and congratulations to you all. And I honor the work and commitment that was necessary for you to arrive at this moment. The very nature of the ceremony forces us to reckon with this moment. The midst of a global pandemic within the context of a national reckoning with racial injustice where ground zero was in your very city. The need to have an online ceremony to address public health concerns in the midst of a changing racial awareness that requires recognition and acknowledgement of our shared humanity, need for human connection, and an understanding of the mutuality of goals for the future is confusing. The demands of our time crash into the needs of the moment, creating a confusing mix of frustration, resentment, misunderstanding, hope, and aspiration. Indeed, there is not a better time to enter this world as a problem solver. As a top 10 school of public affairs, Humphrey's disciplines include myriad ways of learning and methodologies for shaping how to design solutions for public challenges and share problems. Taught in the tradition of Hubert Humphrey with a legacy of leaders like Dr. Retha Clark King and Dr. Josie Johnson, the demands and opportunities of this moment are humbling. As you know, public policy is generally defined as a course of action created or enacted by government in response to public real world problems. It includes agenda setting, formulation, legitimation, implementation, and evaluation. Policy designs entails a concert and deliberate effort to define policy goals and map them. Public affairs and public policy are ultimately the shared set of disciplines and practices that shape rules, laws, regulations, and parameters to implement solutions, to solve problems, and to meet shared challenges that include tools within our criminal justice, taxation, housing, legal, food, education, and all other public systems. And there are a lot of problems to solve. The digital nature of this ceremony makes it very difficult to make jokes or clever offhand remarks. So for that, I apologize. It creates a very serious tone that reflects we're in a serious time and that this is a serious matter. Concentrated power in political and economic elites, the inability to advance policy that has a potential to improve the lives of most Americans, the unbalanced relationship between our economy and our democracy create the conditions that give rise to some of the most important developments that impact most Americans. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the death of over half a million Americans, with millions more infected with the disease. The need to close down the economy to force quarantine conditions to reduce the spread of the virus resulted in deep impacts on individuals, families, and government systems that were not equitably felt across the world. Millions of Americans have become unemployed. State and local governments have lost millions in revenue and millions are at risk for, of eviction and foreclosure. 
The government response has resulted in a lack of confidence on the part of many Americans. Most acutely identified by the fact that America is 4% of the world population, but currently approximately 20% of the deaths from this terrible disease, with most of the deaths being felt in black and brown communities. And while this was unfolding, on May 25th, 2020, Minneapolis police officer arrested George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man after a convenience store employee called 911 and told the police that Mr. Floyd had bought cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. 17 minutes after the first squad car arrived at the scene, Mr. Floyd was unconscious and pinned beneath the knee of a now convicted former Minneapolis police officer for more than nine minutes. Murdered at the scene, his unfair and untimely death, filmed by brave bystanders, uploaded to social media, sparked the largest international response to the manifestation of structural racism in the United States in history. And ground zero was Minneapolis. And I cannot imagine how frustrating and frightening and terrifying it must have been to be here in that time. Minnesota is my home. I'm a product of the Minnesota public school system, the state university system, a feminist leadership fellow from this very institution. And my first job after law school is to have the honor of clerking with the state's highest court. My family and friends are so much a part of the community fabric and political leadership here. I will always feel connected. Minnesota is where I grew up, developed my political voice, came out and came into myself. Yet in a state with some of the highest civic rankings in the country, it also holds some of the greatest disparities by race in educational outcomes, health, housing, income, and wealth. With most of the impacts being felt by black and native Minnesotans who are consistently targeted by public practices that result in the worst outcomes. Minnesota is a place with a great state fair and horrific dichotomies and disparities. I watched my hometown burn from a thousand miles away. I worried about friends and relatives. I listened to national narratives while reading the truth on social media about how communities and neighborhoods banded together to protect themselves from outsiders bent on creating chaos and capitalizing on destruction. I watched while the justified frustration of black, Min black Minnesotans and their allies poured onto the streets in protest of police violence and racial inequity, while the public narrative twisted the story into one of violent, unfocused hatred. As the dust settled and the world turned to the opportunities to capture the energy of the moment and move elections, agendas, policies, and ideas, my thoughts moved to how my hometown would rebuild. What businesses would have insurance? Which national chains would pull out and not return? What would happen to the people in the neighborhoods who now did not have easy access to groceries, pharmacies, and basic goods and services? What about the communities that were consistently targeted by policies that undermine educational, economic, and social success? What would happen to them now? Would local government show leadership? What role would civil society take on? How would philanthropy respond? And now, Humphrey School of Public Affairs, Class of 2021, it is time for you to answer these questions, not as a matter of theory, but as a matter of practice. As you shift your focus from academic to public space, it is time for you to design the solutions for the future. I ask you to remember four things as you move forward. First, stay upset. Second, remember communities are not vulnerable. Third, written rules must be rewritten and unspoken rules must be spoken. And finally, you must begin with the end in mind to change the future. The capacity and power rests with you and the communities you seek to walk with to, see, to support and achieve a future for Minneapolis, Minnesota, the country and the world that rejects the standards and frameworks of white normativity, patriarchy, and systemic racism. 
The ability to shift the material value that rests with whiteness and move it towards a value that rests with shared prosperity is within your control. The ability to hold the idea that each of us holds value by our existence rather than our accomplishment matters. To recognize that lived experience informs the knowledge to solve the problems for the future. Relying upon rigidity, certification, and pedigree are limiting and embody normative values that do not honor and respect the differences of all or consider the legitimacy of all experience. It is from a place of openness and humility that we will learn and grow. It is the ability to embrace experience, leadership, and creativity that exists beyond traditional ideas of expertise and certification that will define our collective ability to create a future where we all can exist beyond the racial and economic inequality that marks the development of our country to date. As you seek to take on leadership in the space of public affairs and public policy, think about the idea of leadership captured by Cornell West. Quote, if your success is defined as being well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference, then we don't want successful leaders. We want great leaders. Leaders who love the people enough and respect the people enough to be unsought, unbound, unafraid, and unintimidated to tell the truth. Tell the truth. Stay upset. It's okay to be upset. It's appropriate to be animated by injustice. Indifference to pain of others and even to ourselves is what got us here. So I ask you to get upset, stay upset, and change the future. Second, can we leave behind the idea of community vulnerability? Communities are intelligent collectives. Communities know what they need and if made a part of solutions will define a new future. When we define entire communities, ethnicities, or races as vulnerable, it is infantilizing and wrong. Vulnerable people need to be protected and are never part of the solutions. When we think of vulnerable people, we work on behalf of them. But what would it mean to work with communities that are targeted? Communities that are targeted for over-policing, under-funding, under-education, under-investment, then those outcomes are predictable. More important, however, the solutions and process for arriving at policy goals are fundamentally different if a community is considered targeted rather than vulnerable. Vulnerability suggests a congenital passive set of conditions that always needs to be accounted for while others plan for the future. Targeting is an active set of engagement by an active set of actors leveraging power that can be changed by the very communities. The characterization of problems is not only important for understanding a place and a people, but also fundamentally shapes how solutions are designed and implemented. When we design solutions for a vulnerable community, that's very different in policy and practice than how we design solutions for targeted communities. I urge you as you seek to solve these words problems that you think carefully about how we design, how we design and define the problems within communities. Third, rules must be rewritten. Every rule, every law, every social norm was established by someone and therefore can be reestablished by you. Written and unwritten practices and policies can be reshaped. Remember, an unwritten must be spoken to be changed. Unwritten rules are the ones that allow for the most social control. Rules about when to speak, where to walk, which fork to use are all used to control actions and therefore ideas. The unspoken rules are the most insidious. And if unspoken rules are not spoken, they can't be identified. And if they're not identified, they can't be marked for change. And we've all seen it in action. She went to the wrong school. He used the wrong fork. And sometimes the worst, just the knowing glance across a conference table. If we wanna challenge unstated normative values based in whiteness, maleness, and capitalistic values, we have to state the unwritten rules. Not speaking controls so much when we think about it, does not talking about money benefit 
anyone except those who already have money? Does not sharing our salaries at work benefit anyone except the employer? Keeping all this information close hoards information. An asymmetry of information always results in inequity. And if information sharing is based on relationship and proximity, segregated spaces create information and resource asymmetry, which at the, are at the core of immoral and inequitable systems. Changing the rules includes the unwritten and unspoken in addition to written policies and laws. We must begin with the end in mind to change the future. It's not enough to know what we don't want. It's not enough to say we're beyond a moment. If we ask a loved one what they want for breakfast and they say not eggs, it doesn't help us define what to prepare. And it's even less helpful for them to say, I don't know what I want for breakfast, but I know we're post dinner. We must know we're going to define the future. Understanding that we're moving towards a care economy is more important than being post neoliberal. Moving towards an anti-racist political system to support a true multiracial democracy is more important than being able to define us as being post-racial. If, if we do not know what we want to shape a future, we cannot remove the vestiges of patriarchy and white supremacy. We will recalcify in all, the, in all our futures if we're not clear about what we're trying to recreate. Equality of ideas, thoughts, and character are only principles if they're not actual policies and practices that disincentivize and make illegal practices based on race, gender, disabilities, sexual orientation, and other immutable characteristics, particularly if discrimination is unspoken but manifest in reality. Having an end in mind means focusing on outcomes, not intention. It means looking at realities, not principles. For example, it means that as we move forward, you must not just consider whether integrated schools generally produce better outcomes for students of color, but in fact, we have to consider how revenue raised for a school system or even an individual school implicates opportunities for all students. How teachers' expectations in the classroom implicate how students define their own opportunity. How a principal is enabled to create a culture for an entire learning community all come together to see that high graduation rates and meaningful achievement markers are attainable for all students. It means we do not determine a future by determining best efforts, but by actually enforcing practices that define outcomes. I do not envy you the work ahead of you, class of 2021. However, I will stand with you to do it. I look forward to a future where the agitated and the agitators rewrite the rules and give voice to unstated practices that create exclusion and limitation. I am giddy with anticipation for the world you will create by giving voice to patterns and practices that hold up systemic racist and sexist structures and therefore transforming systems and institutions worthy of a true multiracial democracy. I look forward to your role in not just diversifying racist institutions, but transforming and creating truly anti-racist institutions. To know that the world you seek to create is one of equity and value and shared prosperity and not just merely an individual identity. This work cannot wait. Congratulations in achieving your goals and graduating and obtaining certification from this important institution. And I congratulate you now for the future you will co-design, co-create, and share with the communities and people with whom you envision a sustainable and equitable future. Thank you. I want to thank Keisha Gaskins Nathan for that message. Good afternoon. My name is Katherine Squires and I am the Associate Dean for the Humphrey School. 
This is my first commencement as Associate Dean, and it is an honor to be here celebrating our incredible class of 2021. It is also a privilege to present this year's Humphrey School Award recipients. Each year we recognize students for their academic excellence, and this year is no exception. Given the format of these virtual commencements, I will only be announcing honorees who are associated with the Master of Public Policy program right now, but to see the full list of awards and recipients, please look to your program. We will also be posting the names of all of the winners online. First, the Award for Excellence in Global Policy, which is given for demonstrated achievement in the field of global affairs. This year, the award goes to Trenton Schoenborn. Trenton's paper, Pragmatic Intervention Could Have Saved Syria, is an outstanding piece of original research organized around a profoundly important and difficult question. Could early international intervention have stopped the Syrian civil war? This is precisely the kind of bold and relevant inquiry we want our students of global policy to pursue not only because it offers them an opportunity to engage important literatures, but also because it shapes their ability to analyze and adjudicate key foreign policy decisions of the kind they may well face as practitioners and policymakers. In the paper, Trenton engaged an inspired methodological approach to tackle that question from a fresh angle. He created an original data set of battle fatalities on both sides of the Syrian conflict from social media accounts in Arabic. And he used that to argue a case that early intervention in Syria by the international community could have prevented the decade long humanitarian catastrophe that has befallen the country. Trenton's work represents a real contribution to the scholarly literature on the Syrian war and on humanitarian intervention more broadly. It is a model of the kind of relevant and creative research our students should pursue, and it reflects the ethically alert and intellectually curious scholar that Trenton has demonstrated himself to be. Congrats, Trenton. The next award is the Diversity Paper Award, which is given to a paper on public policy issues affecting diverse populations in the United States or globally. This year's recipient is Amy Dorman. Amy ex examined the Ramsey County process of health priority setting, which led to having violence be listed as a health priority. In her paper, she addressed the question of what factors are most important, objective data or subjective personal stories and influence in the priority setting processes of local health departments. Her findings are especially important for those concerned with equity. Given the large gaps in data for some issue areas, such as gender-based violence, and for marginalized populations, solely data-driven decision-making policy is likely to continue to ignore marginalized communities and their issues. Subjective influence, however, can serve to bridge that gap. She argues that developing reciprocal relations with community is key to ensuring that subjective influence lifts up community needs. The next award goes to two recipients, the Gross Family Management and Leadership Awards. One is for an individual achievement and one is for a group achievement. This year's Gross Family Individual Paper Award goes to Laura Painter. Laura's paper, Being Better Relatives, How the University of Minnesota Could Transform Its Relationships with American Indians, illustrates the significance and complexity of transforming the culture of the university into one that honors American Indians in ways that directly serve the university's mission. The paper explains the importance of the university recognizing the harm it has caused, including toward fulfillment of its own mission, how it can prevent further harm, and how it can mitigate the reputational and legal risks of continuing to ignore its tribal relationships. The solutions Laura's paper provides are practical, detailed, and grounded in the university's guiding principles and mission statement. And Laura's paper comes at a time when University President Joan Gable has pledged to improve relations with the state's 11 tribal nations. Her paper outlines the key issues, their history, and the current context. 
highlights the 2020 Minnesota Indian Affairs Con Council resolution that directly challenges the university to do better, references relevant scholarly literature, and offers a set of practical recommendations for moving forward. Congratulations, Laura. The Gross Family Leadership Award for Best Group Paper goes to the 2021 Master of Public Policy graduate, David Gottfried, 2021 Master of Human Rights graduate, Bailey Sutter, and first year Master of Public Policy student, as well as incoming PASA president, Kate Ingersoll. Based on careful, high quality research, David, Bailey, and Kate analyzed organizational barriers that impede the pursuit of anti-racist agendas in institutions of higher education and specifically at the Humphrey School. Building directly on their analysis, the students formulated action recommendations that target specific needs and obstacles, identify necessary resources, and do so based on a clear model of organizational change. Finally, to put their plan into action, the students distributed their report beyond the class itself and presented their proposals to a joint meeting of the Humphrey School's Executive Council and Equity and Inclusion Council. They authored a motion to revise the school's constitutional bylaws to facilitate a stronger push towards DEI goals. Congratulations, David, Kate, and Bailey. The next award is the Lloyd B. Short Award for the Best Master's Paper. This award honors the memory of the late Professor Lloyd Short. And this year, the award goes to Alika Beck, Marty Crean, Samuel Estes, Madeline Geitz, and Emilio Vega for a report they wrote as part of their recent capstone project entitled Evaluating Hennepin County's 2020 Emergency Rental Assistance Program. This capstone report is an excellent example of what Humphrey students can accomplish both intellectually and in real world practice. In the spring of 2020, Hennepin County created the Hennepin Emergency Rental Assistance Program to assist low income renters with emergency housing payments. The program sought to, pri sought to prioritize renters of color to further the county's racial equity goals. This capstone project evaluates the effectiveness of the Emergency Rental Assistance Program in reducing racial disparities. Through excellent quantitative analysis, comparing funding allocation of the program and the distribution of evi eviction risks measured by census data, the research team provided extremely timely and fresh analysis. Their work will contribute substantially in the further implementation of the Emergency Assistance Program and could have significant benefits beyond. Congrats to this group. Our next award is the Student Leadership Award. This award is peer selected and seeks to honor a student who demonstrated significant leadership at the Humphrey School. And this year, the award goes to Kania Johnson. She is the inaugural recipient of our Josie Robinson Johnson Fellowship, and Kania has become an integral member of the Humphrey School community and we can see why her fellow students chose to honor her with this award. Her commitment to equity is truly admirable and her selflessness is second to none. Even amid finishing her public policy degree, she volunteer, voluntarily joined our re-entry committee, which seeks to ensure the Humphrey School returns from distance learning stronger, safer, and more equitable than it was before the pandemic. I am so excited to see what Kania does next. And I know after you hear her speak in a moment as the Master of Public Policy student speaker, you will be just as big a fan of her as I am. Congrats, Kania. Our final three awards for this ceremony are the Instructional Awards. These awards are also peer selected and given based on instructional excellence in the classroom. The Teaching Assistant Award for the year goes to Anna Thompson. Anna went above and beyond in the classroom, ensuring her fellow grad students had the support they needed to succeed. And in an incredible sweep, both our Instructor of the Year Award and the Core Course Instructor of the Year Award goes to faculty member, economist, and the only person I know who can make statistics an edge of your seat exciting and fun course, Angie Furtick. Congrats, Angie, on this incredible honor. And congratulations again to all of the end of year award honorees. 
I will now pass the virtual mic to Professor De Deborah Levison, who will present the 2021 Master of Public Policy graduates. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Levison. It is my honor and my great pleasure to present the Master of Public Policy graduating class of 2021. Patrick Alcorn. Ayan Ali. Kyle Anderson. Bill Baker. Brenna Bargefield. Elika Beck. Morgane Butler. Joya Chomalo. Adam Clark. Joshua Clement. Jacqueline Cooney. Sean Crawford. Marty Green, Nicholas Dem, Amy Dorman, Samuel Estes, Rebecca Everett, Hannah Fry, Sarah Friedman, Izzy Galen. Madeline Geitz, David Gottfried, Nicolette Gullickson, Eric Haugen, Rowan Hilty, Ashley Hiralal, Andre Ingram, Kania May Johnson. Martin Kapsch, Krista Kaput, Lauren Kraft, JT Kruger, Tegan Leckler, Yulu Lin, Risa Maldonado, Ivy Marsnick. Brian McNamara, Hannah Malang, Josiah Moore, Whitney Oaks, Laura Painter, Laura Preschelt, Lisa Rao, Ryan Redmer, Sarah. Written Isaac Russell, Sarah Sandgren, Trenton Schoenborn, Isabel Schapa, Molly Sir, Jacob Sprunger, Sam Stork Post, Anna Thompson. E. Tian, Marissa Tillman, Natalie Townsend, Adrian Uphoff, Emilio Vega, Surya Vijayasarathi, Chloe Rainey, Miles Wilburn. Jingzi Emma Wu, Jiapeng Yan, Ben Yawaki, Emily Marita Zafiro, Michaela Ziegler, Hannah Zinn. Congratulations, graduates. We will now hear from MPP student speaker, 
Kania May Johnson. Good afternoon, faculty, staff, alumni, family and friends, and the Resolute class of 2021. It is truly an honor to, be, to have been selected to address you all to celebrate this moment. I've been thinking about this day and what it would mean to me, what it would mean for us. Honestly, it was hard for me to find the words for today and really this past year and a half. Like most of you, I hadn't imagined we would be doing this over Zoom, but here we are. I hadn't imagined it would be during a global pandemic, but here we are. And I absolutely didn't imagine it would be during a time when we would witness accountability be upheld by the law after continuing to witness the countless lives stolen from us because of police violence, but here we are. We are here because of the care and commitment faculty like Angie Fertig have shown us because our success was of the utmost importance to her. We are here because of faculty like Joe Saws, who taught us that he sees and values our well being just as much as our success in the classroom. And we are here because of the overwhelming support our family, friends, and village have shown us to help us and support us in obtaining our degrees. I've been reading a wonderful book on the healing wisdom of Africa. The book describes that the role of community is to safeguard the purpose of each person within it and to remind us of our purpose by recognizing the unique gifts we each bring to our community, to our world. We have set ourselves on a path to make the world a better place, not of our own accord, but instead because of community and our commitment to support each other. We walked through these doors two years ago, wanting to learn more about how we can address the grand challenges of our state, the nation, and the world. Wide-eyed and hopeful. While we didn't envision we'd be wrapping up our time here over Zoom, I can say wholeheartedly that we set ourselves on the path to be the change we wish to see in our communities. I believe we have done so because we've realized the importance of community and our collective duty to safeguard our humanity. For many of us, this day will be a day we remember forever, for many reasons. A day in which we are reminded of the journey and the lessons we've learned that will leave a lasting impression on our minds. So let us celebrate our accomplishments, our ability to be purposeful and determined in receiving our degrees during an unprecedented time. Let us honor the vulnerability and healing we went through, and for some of us, we needed to put ourselves through just to make it to this day as whole as possible. And let us grieve for the pieces of ourselves we lost in the midst of striving for excellence and nothing less. Take a moment to honor and appreciate your journey because walking across the stage or not, we did the damn thing. Excuse my French. Let me wrap up with the sentiment I've shared before because it still holds true. Our ability to persevere is not only a result of our inner strength and resilience, but a reflection of our commitment to serve and support each other. Many of us will go on to work and serve in all kinds of spaces and places, and it's important we know why. We found ourselves here because we wish to create a, a better world, a world of abundance and liberation. We've also found ourselves here at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs because we had a community of folks lifting us up and holding us accountable to be the best version of ourselves. So I hope you continue being critical with an immense amount of care. I hope you all choose to fight and protect the unique gifts of our community and our world. I hope you all choose light, justice, and accountability, no matter the work you do or the places you go. And I hope you all honor this journey for everything it has taught you. Harriet Tubman, a liberator and a remarkable ancestor once said, every great dream begins with a dreamer. 
Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and change the world. Dream big and strive for nothing less. And while it felt impossible at times, we finally made it to the end of our chapter at the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs. It has been my honor and a pleasure to learn alongside you. Congratulations, phenomenal class of 2021. Good afternoon. My name is Yingling Fan. I'm the director of the PhD program. I'm honored to lead this exceptional program with our exceptional students and faculty. For those who are in the audience today, I'd like to thank our PhD students and who are family and friends of our PhD students. Getting a PhD is a long journey. And in this long journey, it is the students, not the faculty, or the administrators who are in the driving seats. Our program would not have been successful without the hard work from the students, as well as the tremendous support from the students, family, and friends. So thank you. Today, it is my pleasure to present the Humphrey School newest Doctors of Philosophy in Public Affairs. Anna Bolgren completed her PhD in the public policy track. Her advisor is Dr. Le uh, Deborah Levinson, and her dissertation looked at methodological uh, strategies for integrating, uh, for investigating how to reach populations, essays from Tanzania, Nepal, and the Syrian Iran. Winston Merrick completed his PhD in the public policy track. Winston's advisor is Jody Sanford, and his dissertation examined using behavior and design science to reduce administrative burdens, evidence from Minneapolis public housing. Ashley Smith completed her PhD in the social policy track. Ashley's advisor is Joe Sass, and her dissertation is on the punished mother essays examining the experiences of mothers living the institutional intersection of child protection and criminal justice. Yunlei Chi completed her PhD in the urban planning track. Her advisor is Greg Lindsay, and her dissertation delved into transit-induced gentrification in U.S. metropolitan areas. Our next PhD graduate is Xinyi Wu, who completed her doctorate in the urban planning track. Her advisors were myself and Jason Tao, and her dissertation explored examining contextual and nonlinear associations between the living environment and life satisfaction. Congratulations to all our new doctors. We will now hear from PhD student speaker, Ashley Smith. Dean Bloomberg, members of faculty and guests, it is an honor to represent the PhD program. On behalf of my fellow graduates, I would like to extend our most profound appreciation to our family and friends. Without their wavering support, this journey would not have been possible. When I began the PhD program, I would never have imagined giving the commencement speech from my home. Of course, these are certainly odd and challenging times, and as bizarre and difficult as these times are, right, the pand pandemic, political turmoil, and racial disparities in nearly every facet of life has reinforced to me and likely to my fellow graduates the reason why the Humphrey School is so important. In times like these, we see that existing inequalities only become more pronounced. Because of structural inequities that cause pervasive disparities, members of marginalized communities, especially people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ individuals, and people with disabilities are disproportionately affected by the ongoing crises. The injustices occurring are not a result of one's identity, but rather a consequence of structural oppression that devalues certain people. 
Of course, these disparities are not surprising to those of us graduating from the Humphrey School. We came here because we saw wicked problems such as oppression and inequities that needed to be solved. We knew there was a lot more that we could be doing. And in pursuit of the school's mission statement to inspire, educate, and support innovative leaders to advance the common good in a diverse world, we have learned ways to leverage research to effectuate change. As a first generation mixed race woman and former foster child, I have continuously sought opportunities to improve the lives of children and families in the United States. It is that passion that led me here to the Humphrey School. During my time in undergrad, I continuously asked how I would make change for people that started out their lives like me. Through great undergraduate faculty, I found that research was one way to have a broad impact. So to have a broad impact, I actually um, needed to learn how to conduct research. So six years later, I have gained the tools and knowledge to effectively use research to improve the lives of children and families through high quality research and contributing to changes in policy and practice. Our experience at the Humphrey School will hopefully mean that we emerge better equipped to walk out into the world and advance the common good. But I also learned something less expected and equally important from ensuring researchers have high quality measurements to understanding how and why occupational licensing impacts the vulnerable, students are exposed to a range of important issues here. The lessons I learned from both the classes I took, the students and faculty I spoke with, broadened my worldview on how collaborative interdisciplinary work can advance the common good. As political theorist Iris Marion Young said, Structural injustices are harms that come to people as a result of structural processes in which many people participate. As we graduate today, we each embark on the next chapter in our lives. Some of us will go into academia, others will go work for the government or the private sector, and yet no matter where we end up, we all leave the Humphrey School better prepared to, as Iris Marion Young noted, transform the structures that produce or perpetuate injustices. This responsibility may seem daunting, but now more than ever, the skills we refined and gained in our PhD program are urgently needed. So congratulations to my fellow graduates. We did it, the world needs us, and I can't wait to see what is next for each and every one of us. Thank you. Greetings, graduates and families, faculty and staff, distinguished guests, everyone joining us. I am honored to preside at this commencement on behalf of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. To the graduates, I extend congratulations. Through your talent, hard work, and determination, you have earned this day of recognition. We not only celebrate your academic accomplishments, but also the potential you have to make a positive difference in the next stage of your lives. You'll be contributing to your communities, the state of Minnesota, the nation, and even the world. To all the family and friends joining from near and far, thank you for the countless ways you've supported these students as they earned their academic degrees. In keeping with commencement tradition, Will the graduates please rise as they are able? Upon the recommendation of the faculty and by the authority of the regents, I now confer upon you the degrees for which you have qualified. Congratulations to every single one of you. You've done it. I've loved seeing all of the messages pouring into the chat function of congratulations and support. And now you are truly commenced. Graduate, I hope you're feeling the love and the respect and the very high regard focused on you right now. I also want to thank our speakers today, Ms. Keisha Gaskins-Nathan, MPP graduate, Kania Johnson, 
and PhD graduate, Dr. Ashley Smith. Once more, hearty congratulations to the graduating class of 2021. As you move forward in your efforts to advance the common good in a diverse and changing world, clearly unfinished business, as we have heard from all the speakers today, I hope you will continue to make time to take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you. The 37 MPA graduates receiving their diplomas today represent the diversity of students who enroll into this program. They might be 30 or 65. They're white and they're BIPOC. They're employed in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, and they live in the Twin Cities or they might be in Ortonville, Minnesota. But they have already distinguished themselves as nonprofit leaders, community activists, and innovators elected officials, their state and local public servants, their teachers, environmentalists, medical doctor, a veterinarian, a journalist, a deputy sheriff, and a political campaign consultant. They have come to this program to make a difference in a world that is starving for a new kind of leadership, and they're already making a difference. Congratulations. Hello, I'm Larry Jacobs, and I teach the core course on politics at the Humphrey School. I was so impressed with my fall class. We started as the protests around George Floyd were still going on in which emotions and frustrations and anger and fear were very much in the air. And we dove right in. We talked about power and race. And then we talked about institutions, both the resistance to change and the opportunities to bring about necessary adjustments and progress. It was a hard conversation. I was so impressed with the class and the Humphrey students and their willingness to dig in, to be honest, and to take this seriously. Thank you. This is a year I will never forget. I'm Deborah Levison. This is a shout out to the 12 students who worked on professional papers in my seminar. Starting and finishing a big project like a master's paper is challenging under any circumstances, but this spring was the worst. And you all rocked. You supported each other, you made progress, and you're done or close to done. Thank you for your grace under pressure and for being yourselves. Congratulations, Humphrey grads. What a time to be getting a degree in public affairs. You've come through some of the most tumultuous years that we can remember and you persevered and you have this experience and this knowledge now that's gonna set you up to be successful. Wish you the best and have been so honored to have the chance to be part of your journey. Congratulations to the class of 2021. You know, you did it, you survived. Um, you, all, you all are some of the most resilient students I've ever had. Um, and I wanna give a shout out to my graduating advisees, Brina, Isabel, Nicolette, um, and Morgane, congratulations. And also, one, I also wanna give a special out, um, shout out to all of the students who took data viz. Um, it's been a pleasure to see um, how far you all have come and the types of visualizations that you make. Uh, so go forth, celebrate, eat some pie, but no pie charts. Congratulations, Humphrey graduates of 2021. It has been an honor to get to know you through classes and online events this year. Your commitment to accountability and social change within the physical and virtual spaces at the Humphrey School is inspiring. Your work in the local climate and energy class demonstrated your commitment to issues beyond the walls of the Humphrey School, such as helping the city of Minneapolis think about the next phase of climate action planning centered on equity. 
Congratulations again, class of 2021. Congratulations, class of 2021, Humphrey. Students, you are amazing. I am so thrilled that I got to spend some time with you over the last couple of years, and I wish you all the best. I wanna give a shout out to my TAs from STATS this year. Uh, Anna, Kania, Patrick, and Ryan, you guys are awesome. You were the best team. This was a hard year to be a TA. For STATS, you had to do everything on Zoom, and you guys did it. You helped me be a good professor. You helped the students feel welcome to the Humphrey community, and you taught them uh, how to do everything they needed to for the class. Um, I just cannot thank you enough for how much work you did. And I want you to know that I will always remember this year and you all, and I wish you the best. Congratulations. Huge congratulations to the graduating class of 2021. I'm so proud of you. It's been an honor to get to know you over the last two years, and I have great faith that you'll go on to do incredible things that make this world a better place. Please remember to take care of yourself and each other. I wish you all the best. Graduates, I could not be more proud of you all. You're exactly the kind of creative, passionate, innovative leaders that the human rights field needs. And you've impressed me in so many ways. You've stood up for racial and social justice. You've done incredible work in your classes and capstones and internships. And you've really been there for each other in this hard year. You've put your hearts into your time here and I know you'll do the same throughout your career. It's been an honor to be a part of your journey. So good luck, my friends. I'd like to highlight a recent PhD graduate, Dr. Winston Merrick. Uh, he received a federal grant to study administrative burdens in public housing. In his dissertation, he applied the approach in behavioral science and human-centered design to help Minneapolis Public Housing Authority uh, to reduce the number of tenants that got behind their rental payments. Dr. Merrick's work is only one of the many examples that our students not only study the problem, they also uh, uh, develop implementable solutions that have broader societal impacts. Congratulations, graduates of the Masters of Human Rights. We will miss you here in the ivory tower, but we need you out there. And we're excited for the important work that you will do. Congratulations on your graduation. You've earned your degree, and you've done so under very trying circumstances. You've weathered the pandemic, a shift to online learning, the murder of George Floyd and the uprising that followed, a tumultuous election, and their insurrection at the Capitol. Yet you've prospered. We're so proud of you. You're now part of an elite group, the 13 percenters. Only 13% of all Americans over 25 have a master's degree. This is proof of the great things you have in store for your career. I've had the pleasure this spring of working with more than 30 of you in nine of your capstones. You've worked on problems like climate change, brownfields redevelopment, rural immigration, and the challenges of wrestling with, with racism uh, across, across the U.S. You've worked on food security, planning public facilities, and working to help farmers become more resilient. Again, the work you've done in these capstones is proof of the great careers that you're about to have. Thank you for choosing Humphrey for your graduate school. Thank you for the hard work you've done while you've been here. And thank you for all the great things you'll accomplish in your career. Godspeed. Transforming development graduates, I look forward to seeing you like dandelion seeds disseminate the ideas and ways of being across the world. Congratulations. Congratulations, Humphrey graduates. I am so proud of you and happy for you. Um, it has been an utter pleasure to work with you. Uh, and I've seen with such pride and been so impressed by the courage and skill and tenacity that you have brought to all kinds of problems, big and small, uh, to sustaining what needs to be sustained and to changing and disrupting the things that need changing. Keep going and congratulations. 